So um, today we're doing a brief overview of opioid intoxication and withdrawal. This is our accreditation statement and disclosure statement, of which I have none. So briefly, we'll talk about um, what opioids are. Um, we'll talk about the symptoms, diagnosis, and management of intoxication, similar to the symptoms, diagnosis, and management of withdrawal, and then key conclusions. So people um, who are not in the health professions often interchange the terms opiates and opioids, and even those of us in the field often can get confused too. So opiates are the, are the direct products from opium, which is the naturally occurring juice of the opium poppy. And I'm gonna butcher this, but popover somniferum. <laughs> The three opiates are morphine, codeine, and thebane, and it's from those compounds that the semi-synthetics are made, which include drugs like heroin, hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and buprenorphine, among others. Because some of the semi-synthetics break down to metabolites that include morphine, they do sometimes show up on drug screens, but not always. And it's the opioids that are a bigger category and are basically all of our drugs that function like opiates because they primarily act through the opiate receptors, being the mu, kappa, delta, and opiate receptor like one receptors. The fully synthetics include drugs like methadone, fentanyl, and tramadol, and they are essentially usually missed on our standard urine drug screens that tend to look for opiates, not just the opioids. So um, moving to intoxication symptoms, and the biggest one we all know of and worry about is overdose. Classically, the heroin overdose symptom is, um, or syndrome is a triad of altered mental status, respiratory depression, and meiosis, or pupillary constriction. But you don't need all three to diagnose opioid overdose. You just need altered mental status, and then either respiratory depression, meiosis, um, or circumstantial signs of, track use, like tra uh, of drug use, like track marks or soft tissue infection. Oops, looks like I'm having... Can you, I can't hit the down, oh, thanks. Other intoxication signs and symptoms um, are the autonomic abnormalities like low blood pressure, low body temperature, and low heart rate. Other neurologic symptoms include analgesia or pain relief. GI symptoms include decreased bowel sounds, um, nausea and vomiting. And then when it comes to that respiratory depression, it's important to remember that the tidal volume or the um, actual air movement that goes in and out of the lungs decreases even before um, the rate does. You can't always count on these symptoms to diagnose opioid overdose um, in, in a variety of situations. For example, co-ingestion. So if someone uses a sympathomimetic like amphetamine, ephedrine, cocaine, or ecstasy, you can see either a balancing out or autonomic hyperactivity. Similarly, in, with overdose of agents like tramadol or meperidine that can trigger serotonin syndrome, particularly if in combination with other serotonergic agents. And then um, drugs like meperidine don't actually cause that pupillary constriction. So in general, it's thought that um, respiratory rate is that best indicator of severe toxicity. Certainly the timeline of intoxication. Oh, I'm somehow missing a slide. Maybe it's, no, oh, down, I don't know how that happened. There, we'll just skip a little bit, sorry about that. So the um, timeline of intoxication does depend upon the pharmacokinetics of the drug, um, with fentanyl being immediate onset, with a half-life of two to four hours, and then the more common prescription pain pills like oxycodone and hydrocodone, a little bit slower in onset, um, peak, and half-life. Um, so this is just a list of the um, different symptoms of intoxication and how they unfold in the body. The majority are through the mu receptors, but these uh, receptors are throughout the CNS, uh, the central nervous system, sorry, the peripheral nervous system and even other tissues. So for example, the respiratory effects do occur in the brainstem via chemoreceptors, but they also are opiate receptors in the carotid bodies and the vagal nerves. Um, analgesia occurs in both the brain and the spine. GI effects are actually in the myenteric and submucosal plexus of the intestines. 
And then um, the antitussive or the inhibition of the cough reflex is both at the medulla, but also in the peripheral nervous system and the lung. Um, so I, I kind of list this just to say that the physiology of opioid intoxication is really complicated, um, and it feels kind of like a maze. So to kind of emphasize that point, I just wanted to show you this cross section of our rat brain that maps out all of the different site and types of opiate receptors, um, which I just find really impressive. <laughs> So key risk factors for overdose are potency, with fentanyl being more potent and um, codeine being one of the least potent. IV use, so you can still overdose with um, oral ingestion or nasal insufflation. Sporadic use because of that loss of tolerance in, in periods of abstinence. Needing help with injection, prior overdose, um, and then concurrent use with another substance. Other, hmm. I don't know, I don't know, if, sorry. <laughs> uh, major complications besides overdose include QT prolongation. Um, for example, drugs like methadone can um, lengthen that QT interval, the way the electricity flows through the heart and trigger fatal arrhythmias. Prolonged hypoxia during overdose can lead to events like myocardial infarction, rhabdomyolysis or seizures. Heroin overdose is classically associated with a form of pulmonary edema um, that is not based on heart function. The um, anti-cough effects can lead to easy aspiration and from there a chemical pneumonitis or even a bacterial pneumonia. And then um, needle contamination or local soft tissue infection can um, result in bacteremia. So the signs and symptoms of intoxication also can be um, complicated by the variety of other um, syndromes or diagnoses that occur simultaneously with their own symptom presentation. Okay, hopefully the rest will be in order. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, if someone is breathing spontaneously above 12 uh, breaths per minute, you can observe them and just make sure they don't become more somnolent, but if someone is inadequately ventilating, then the standard of care is to give a dose of naloxone. Um, at, and if you have IV access already, you can go ahead and give an IV dose, 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 mgs. If you don't have IV access already and you don't think you can get it quickly, then the recommendation is a full milligram of intranasal naloxone, which is Narcan. Um, you allow one to two minutes for IV, a little bit longer for intranasal and sub-Q. And if you see only a partial response, then you should go ahead and give another dose at that two minute mark. If someone is truly apneic, meaning they're not breathing at all, you do start with a higher dose. And similarly, if someone is in cardiac arrest in, um, in the setting of an opioid overdose. Um, one thing to remember is that when someone doesn't breathe spontaneously, it's not just their oxygen level that suffers, but also the CO2 level builds up. And so you have to watch end tidal CO2. You can't just check someone's peripheral oxygenation level. And then finally, remembering that naloxone's half-life is sh much shorter than a lot of the other opioids, that, uh, than a lot of the opioids. And so you have to watch for at least two to three hours to ensure that someone isn't going to have um, repeat intoxication um, or overdose after that naloxone begins to wear off. Okay, so switching gears, um, the diagnosis of opioid withdrawal involves four main sections. Um, a withdrawal can be either precipitated after the administration of an opioid antagonist, meaning a receptor blocker like naloxone or Narcan, um, or spontaneous after someone who uses um, large amounts of opioids begins to cut back or stops altogether. You need at least three or more symptoms. Here's our list. GI symptoms, mood, muscle aches, um, runny nose, tearing of the eyes, uh, pupil dilation, sweating and goosebumps, fever, yawning, insomnia, and diarrhea. These symptoms must cause significant distress or impairment and certainly can't be due to another diagnosis. There are a number of other symptoms that aren't part of that formal diagnosis. Um, anorexia, loss of appetite, um, tachycardia, hypertension, restlessness, and increased pain. Much like with the um, intoxication, the pattern of withdrawal depends upon the pharmacokinetics too, with fentanyl being the fastest onset of withdrawal, around three to five hours, and complete 
five days with and methadone much longer with an onset of withdrawal at 24 to 72 hours and complete by 14 to 21 days. Intensity of withdrawal is associated with the speed of onset and short acting nature of the drug. So those that um, affect the body sooner and faster tend to have more intense and earlier withdrawal discomfort. <laughs> Even after acute withdrawal is over, a lot of symptoms, uh, a lot of patients describe um, continued uncomfortable symptoms, which is referred to either as post acute withdrawal or protracted abstinence or protracted withdrawal. There's a lot more literature on this for alcohol use, but it does um, come up in opioid use as well. Um, it's essentially a prolonged period of alteration in physiology and mood, things like temperature control, um, respiratory rate, blood pressure, heart rate, pupil dilation. Patients can also describe prolonged craving, dysphoria, anxiety, low mood, insomnia, and concentration issues. And these symptoms can last for weeks to months or even longer. An important component of withdrawal management is assessment of withdrawal severity. So um, Jeff mentioned the COW scale, but the very earliest was this um, scale uh, created by a researcher last name Himmelsbach. And if anyone knows this person knows their first name, please tell me because I cannot <laughs> find it. It's so weird. C.K. Himmelsbach. <laughs> it was developed in the 30s and 40s. Um, and it focused primarily on the physiologic changes. And when we show the cows later, you'll see that there's um, a lot more than just physiology now included. Um, and I'll use this as an opportunity for a history of science tidbit that he worked at the um, Addiction Research Center in Lexington, Kentucky, which was housed alongside the United States Public Health Service Hospital and also the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And it was um, the major foundation of our knowledge in addiction work, both intoxication, withdrawal, and treatment, really stems from what emerged out of the collaboration of those three institutions. And um, so ARC, for example, became NIDA. The United States Public Health Service Hospital became the National Institute of, Me of Mental Health. And um, the other piece of that that I want to honor is that the, pat the patients who participated as research participants came out of all three of those institutions. So it was a combination of people who truly volunteered, people who were seeking treatment in lieu of a federal prison sentence, and then actually prisoners themselves. And not that addiction stands alone in its kind of questionable ethical research history, but just to kind of give honor to all of the patients who are often forgotten, who gave a lot to contribute to the knowledge that we have today. So. Oh yeah, a bunch of other scales um, have been developed since, and then most recently the clinical opiate withdrawal scale in the late 90s, which is what we, we basically use now. It's a validated rapid 11 item rating system to track withdrawal through serial measurement. And in the hospital, um, as you saw on Jeff's case presentation, we often measure it every four to eight hours, depending on where someone is in their withdrawal process or induction onto an agent. In a clinic setting, we often, if someone's starting buprenorphine, we kind of do a more standard zero minutes, 30 and 120 minutes to see how someone is responding to a medication. And these are the items that are tracked, pulse, sweating, restlessness, pupil size, um, bony pain and joint aches, runny nose or tearing of the eyes, GI upset, tremor, yawning, anxiety, irritability, and goose flesh. And these are scored, each one of them, zero to four or zero to five, and then summed to achieve an overall severity rating. Um, when it comes to treating withdrawal, I think the most fundamental concept is that um, you want to help someone not feel like they're suffering because withdrawal symptoms and withdrawal discomfort is one of the biggest triggers for people to go use again. And so when it comes to helping someone stay in treatment, whether that's not leaving against medical advice in the hospital or sticking it out with treatment in the outpatient setting, you want to make sure someone is able to tolerate what they're experiencing. And so the four buckets that we can really think about are the agents to provide supportive care or symptom um, management, which are the alpha agonists and some other meds out there, um, directly treating withdrawal with an actual opioid agonist. And then there are a couple ways to speed it up being naltrexone assisted or ultra rapid. So we're just gonna go through these briefly too. So 
alpha agonists or um, more fully alpha adrenergic uh, receptor agonists are agents like clonidine, lofexidine, also dexmedon, I can never say this, dexmedetomidine or prethodex, <laughs> and tizanidine, and they work by blocking the noradrenergic output from the locus ceruleus in the brain. So noradrenergic output is what triggers that autonomic hyperreactivity or hyperactivity, the anxiety, the restlessness, and the dysphoria. And um, these agents help treat those symptoms, but they actually treat a lot of the withdrawal symptoms. They have blood pressure effects, um, which is how they treat those autonomic symptoms, right? So you start at a low dose, like 0.1 to 0.2 mg per day, and go up slowly. And then when someone's symptoms begin to resolve, you taper down slowly as well to avoid rebound hypertension. Other supportive care agents can include meds like dicyclamine for cramps, loperamide for diarrhea, ondansetron for nausea. For sleep, we have things like trazodone, catiapine, and zolpidem. For the muscle aches and joint aches, we have just Tylenol and ibuprofen. And then um, clonidine and, and those alpha agonists can really help with anxiety, but if not enough, um, there are other agents like hydroxyzine, gabapentin, and in the right patient scenario, even the benzodiazepines like clonazepam. <clears throat> um, one way to more directly treat withdrawal is to simply provide an opioid agonist, meaning a full agonist like methadone or a partial agonist like buprenorphine. Usually when giving these medicines, we're, the intention is to get someone stable on a medicated assisted treatment regimen, but not everybody, kind of like our other patient discussed earlier, wants to be on a long-term agonist, um, or they might want to be on an antagonist instead. And so in that setting, these medicines can at least help create a more controlled experience of withdrawal, where you titrate up to a stabilizing dose and then taper down more slowly. There's a variety of protocols out there. It depends on whether you're inpatient or outpatient and how quickly someone wants to achieve that goal. One of the biggest issues with a slow agonist taper is um, it creates an opportunity for relapse before someone can get onto a medication like an antagonist, um, being naltrexone or extended release naltrexone or Vivitrol. Um, so this is just an example of a protocol that um, actually constricts that taper window, makes the withdrawal process shorter to increase the likelihood that somebody can get onto an extended release antagonist. Um, so if someone is in withdrawal on day one, you give a stabilizing dose of buprenorphine on day two, um, that covers them on day three also. And then on day four, you actually start very low dose naltrexone of around one to three milligrams and titrate up over a series of one to four days until they can tolerate a larger dose, like 25 or 50 milligrams of naltrexone, and then you can actually go ahead and give that injection. This is a model that comes out of Columbia. Um, I've got some citations on the bottom for those of you that are interested in doing it. The trickiest part is getting access to those low-dose naltrexone doses, which um, here in Madison are really just available from one of the compounding pharmacies. But um, the data uh, are definitely supportive that it helps people successfully initiate onto extended release naltrexone. And we know that if someone can really get onto that extended release naltrexone, that their um, chances of, of recovery or staying on a medic, staying in treatment are essentially comparable to buprenorphine. Um, along the way, you also want to be thinking about your adjuncts. This protocol calls for clonidine, clonazepam, ibuprofen, and triazodone. Um, and if you're curious, those date ranges are based upon how much opioid somebody was using before starting this withdrawal um, plan. Um, so if you're a very heavy user, it takes a little bit longer. And if you, um, the person was using less opioid, they can actually do it faster. Finally, there is something theoretically out there called ultra rapid opioid detoxification. It's really rarely done and really recommended. The patient actually goes under general anesthesia and then they receive either an orogastric, meaning um, uh, a, a mouth to tube, to mouth to stomach tube, or an IV infusion of an antagonist like naloxone for about six hours. Um, and then they're observed for you know, 24 to 36 hours and discharged. Um, there, is, there are some serious complications with it, um, heart attacks, psychosis, suicide, um, other causes of death. Um, 
And not to mention that, you know, as we saw that how the half-life of different medications is different and um, doses like fentanyl can stack. And so some patients will still experience some withdrawal symptoms even after that six hour mark anyway. So this is not something that is done very much. And I just show it as like a, a thing that's out there to know about. <laughs> So in conclusion, key aspects of intoxication, your signs are altered mental status, respiratory depression, myosis, and track marks. Your major risk factors are history of overdose, sporadic use, and co-ingestion. Um, if you see overdose, give naloxone and repeat. <laughs> and for withdrawal, just make sure you're really focusing on treating withdrawal to prevent relapse. Your, um, your, your agents are your alpha agonists, and then your opioid agonists or antagonists. And don't forget to provide um, pharmaceutical and emotional support during that post-acute withdrawal period to help folks stay in treatment. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, Thank Alyssa. You. That's great. We have just a, a few minutes left for uh, the bottom of our hour. Any questions or comments? Oh, yeah, we got a few. Let's see, can I be? Uh, Paul Hudson suggests naloxone if someone found in Torsad in the presence of methadone or other opioids. So mm -hmm. yeah, fair point by way of pointing that out. If yeah. someone has an arrhythmia, potentially attributable, attributable to QT prolongation then naloxone can be treated for that. And the other thing I, I thought of just as you were talking about sort of um, supporting someone presenting with overdose and administering naloxone and and that protocol, I, I just think it's important to remember that reassessment, particularly mm -hmm. of fentanyl being in the opioid supply. Um, individuals uh, receiving that from uh, standing orders in the mobile needle exchange program are pretty frequently reporting uh, in excess of three doses being yeah. needed to bring someone back from opioid overdose. So those involved in providing naloxone to individuals struggling with an opioid use disorder or perhaps on opioids or well, primarily opioid use disorder, important to remember to be dispensing more than one unit yeah. these days. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks again, everyone. Yeah. Uh, pleasure to see all the new faces and hope that we'll see you back in March. And keep in mind, um, if cases come to you that would be helpful to discuss here, uh, always on the lookout for that, and I'd appreciate you bringing them to us so we can all learn. I have one, one little comment. Um, this is Ritu Bhatnagar. Just um, the home induction, um, if people are doing that, we have had some success using that subjective opioid withdrawal scale, so just coaching people on using that themselves. So I, I do use that a yeah. little bit more when people are using that at home. I wonder about other people's uh, responses to that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. We've, been, we've been doing that quite a bit. And while um, earlier guidelines had really encouraged in-office induction, they're really in more recent versions is acknowledgement that that in uh, studies has been done safely and effectively and is something that in, that in other studies patients have preferred. So something to, to keep in mind for your own practices. And uh, also just as a, I, I did put a response out about that question on the chat, but uh, in case people have, can't see it or, or didn't know to look there, the question was about um, our, um, the case and about whether, um, how we were able to arrange direct transfer to intake at the residential. Um, it was challenging because particularly since he was living in a different county when he first was at our hospital, but uh, yeah, we, we made lots and lots of phone calls, did a lot of uh, connecting with his public defender, trying to get his um, probation officer on the phone as well, trying to get as many barriers cleared out for him as possible. And then the stars just aligned really well um, for him to, for it to all just work out so that he could go directly from our hospital to, um, to the residential treatment. So I'm just glad that it worked out.